I'm going to sort of frame this uh, perhaps a little differently than, uh, than any of us have been thinking about. A lot of us have been talking about uh, promotion of the national parks. I'm going to talk about that, about the centennial, this huge opportunity that we have. And I'm going to do a little bit of a grand thoughts, as, uh, as Derek asked us to do uh, coming here, is really grand thoughts about um, the National Park Service. And I'm going to start with, that unless you've been on another planet, uh, recently, you might notice that we are in the throes uh, of an election year, and uh, and as uh, most of you know, uh, Washington is a very tough uh, town. Uh, this kind of demonstrates the juxtaposition of the National Park Service uh, uh, with uh, with Washington. That is our reflecting pool, the Lincoln Reflecting Pool, which had a giant alcohol bloom in it here recently, which has generated a bit of interest. And I think that the key is that our our candidates for uh, president or the House of Representatives or the Senate or governor or whatever have been spending enormous amount of energy and time on what divides this country. Uh, blue or red, black, white, brown, Christian, Mormon, Muslim, Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative, rich or poor. Uh, Ken Burns says that uh, we have a little too much pluribus and not enough unum. <laughs> So I want to devote this talk uh, to the UNO. Uh, but really, what are the values that, that really bring us together as a nation, that, rather than divide us, which we spend a lot of time talking about? You know, really, what are the values that makes us uniquely American, that citizens of the United States, symbols for the, of freedom and justice for the, and fairness, really, for the rest of the world, that draw international visitors to us, draw immigrants to us? And, Really, what are these core values that, um, that cause people to want to come to this country to visit or to live? And I personally think that this country needs a reminder of what those core values are. And I strongly believe that there's no better place to find that reminder than in our national parks. And I think even greater than that, I think we have a responsibility in the parks community uh, to to stand up and, and step up to this societal obligation to help reacquaint all American citizens with what are the values that make us, make us Americans. So what I'm going to call this talk is a field guide to American values found in our national parks. So let's start out with a little journey here at the uh, sort of the seminal documents of our great country, Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all our men were created equal, that they were endowed with, by their creator, with certain unalienable rights, that, certain, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And then the Constitution. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity to ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States. We stated in the preamble to our call to action that the aspirations of the Declaration of Independence and the, the Constitution are based upon our Founders' belief that every individual has this right to life and to liberty and to the pursuit of happiness. And these lessons really were formed out of the formative years of our country when we our first round of immigrants that came here uh, were, were escaping uh, countries where uh, they didn't have those, those rights. And, you know, the founders and the subsequent generations also knew that the grandeur of the American landscape really compared in many ways equally to the cathedrals and the castles of the old world. So it really was, to a certain degree, inevitable that an institution would be created that would preserve both place and history and lessons of those on the land. And that is the National Park Service, established 100 years ago almost in 2016. So what are these primary values uh, that, uh, that bind us? You know, you can probably easily come up with things like honor, patriotism, sacrifice, ingenuity, freedom, tolerance, hard work. Those are all I think we can agree on. Uh, de Tocqueville said that when America stops being good, it will stop being great. But there's always a debate about 
what are American values. And who gets to define the list? You know, Tommy Franks, who served on our board, said there's nothing more patriotic than our national parks. And certainly patriotism is a, is a core American value. And so where would you go if you were going to experience patriotism or connect your kids with that, that deep American value? So I'm going to make the case that over the last 100 years, the American people have chosen to set aside 398 places within this country as units of the national park system because we value them. And being a unit of the national park system is not easy. It's a big lift for um, Congress or presidential proclamation, and it often comes after a very long and lengthy involvement uh, of the American public. And they they have to be they have to meet a pretty high bar, the highest national significance. And then the Organic Act for the National Park Service calls for us to conserve these places unimpaired for the enjoyment of our current and future generations. So we've set aside these places that really represent the best of our natural landscapes and our most historical events. So if you take it, if you take this concept that people set aside those things that they value, then I think it's a reasonable assumption that the national park units actually represent most, if not all, the core American values. I'm going to go with that in this discussion. So rather than having a long debate about what are the American values, I think instead we're going to assert, for the purposes of this talk, that the national parks are actually a collective expression of the American values. So let's, let's explore that. Let's start out with the one that was right in the beginning, which is happiness. So there's no question that our seminal document says we have the right to pursue happiness. And where better to pursue it than in a beautiful national park area or recreation area? We have 18 of them, from Lake Mead up here to uh, Lake Chelan, in Washington, Lake Powell, Lake Meredith, Lake Roosevelt. 3.6 million acres out there available for all Americans to come and have some fun. Go boating, go fishing, go swimming, get away from it all. How about ingenuity? The hallmark of American tradition, one that you need to look no further than Edison National Historic Site, where that great inventor was awarded 1,093 patents. Everything from the phonograph, to the alkaline battery, or Dayton Aviation, where the Wright brothers really fail over and over and over again, which is the core to, to ingenuity, ingenuity, to ultimate goal to human flight. Certainly, we would consider bravery as a core American value. And to feel like you need to no, go no further than to stand over the deck of the USS Arizona at Valor and Pacific National Monument in Pearl Harbor, where thousands died on September, December 7, 1941, but others risked their lives to res rescue the wounded in the chaos of that attack. I would suggest that Americans are imbued with a, a spirit of adventure, and where better than to test your skills on the icy slopes of Mount Rainier or here down the rivers of the Colorado River and the Grand Canyon or on the, the big walls of Yosemite National Park. I have also read that Americans are the hardest working people in the planet, so that industriousness must be a core value. So you need to travel no further than Lowell National Historical Park, or one of our absolute newest, anybody know where that is? That New Jersey. Patterson Falls National Historic Park in New Jersey. To really see the industriousness of our early pioneers that harness these waters, these mighty rivers, to give us, to give this country an economic boom and a path to, to really becoming a world trade power. The American tapestry is a complex one, and I would suggest a core American value is that we're willing to admit our mistakes and learn from them. And to see this in full display, you need to go no further than Manzanar or Minidoka National Historic Site to witness the incarceration of American citizens for no other reason than the color of their skin and their ethnic background. 
I would say that the world would say that we are a persistent lot and that doggedly pursuing individuals particularly in spite of enormous odds. Therefore, the newest National Park Service area, Cesar Chavez National Monument, tells the story of one man who saw an injustice to his fellow farm workers and led a movement to improve their lives, even through his own personal sacrifice, to reduce their exposure to pesticides and give them health care and basic housing. And I put up this shot not because of any political uh, swing here, but it made me incredibly proud uh, that uh, the president would come and uh, be there for the designation of Cesar Chavez National Monument just a week or so ago. At the center of this value, of course, is the pursuit of civil rights. And this flame uh, and this core value burns probably most brightly here in the United States. But it has been a troubled path for us. And you need to experience that. You need only to go to Selma to Montgomery National Historic Trail, where you can see Dr. King leading the 1965 Voting Rights uh, March. And along that way, the visitor needs only to be to go to really sit in the pew at Dr. King's Ebenezer Baptist Church, where I have sat, and listen to the, the current sermons, or to go to Martin Luther King National Historic Site, or to go to the Lincoln Memorial and stand on the steps where Dr. King delivered his I Have a Dream speech. And now they can go to the mall and stand before the statue of Martin Luther King Memorial, National Park Service site, of course, the first memorial on the National Mall to an African-American leader. At these times of crisis in our great country, we have been fortunate to have great leaders. And you can find leadership as a core value and inspiration amongst the memorials to Lincoln, Washington, and Mr. Jefferson, where I spent the winter with him in 1976 uh, in his memorial or to the homes of LBJ, Linda Baines Johnson, Teddy Roosevelt at Sagamore Hill, or Franklin Delano Roosevelt National Historic Sites, all units of the National Park System. To trek through the FDR Memorial, you can experience the chaos that FDR faced as president from economic depression to war and how he, in spite of his physical limitations, he led the nation. In these contemporary times, I believe it is our desire to honor our men and women in uniform it is a core value that transcends all political things that divide us. Our U.S. has been at war many, many times, even with ourselves, and we continue to honor those that have made the ultimate sacrifice to our country. To see that, to, to experience that value, you need only to travel to the battlefields of Antietam, Gettysburg, Yorktown, Fort McHenry, Shiloh, Manassas, to our own ground where our own blood was shed, or to the quiet memorials of Vietnam, World War II, or the Korean War memorials, to give respect to those that, that died on other shores. I once counted uh, for a speech I did to the military that the National Park Service has over 170,000 military dead buried in National Park units. Uh, in this country, in historic cemeteries. In my nearly 40 years with the NPS, I see that a core American value is respect for nature and a willingness to restrain ourselves from the overwhelming desire to overcome and take over special places with our development, with our technology, and our population. The manifestation of this was the what Wallace Steger called our best idea, was the establishment of national parks. Not only their physical presence, but the concept that we would do that. We would set aside Yellowstone, the Everglades, the Badlands, Mount Rainier, Death Valley, Glacier, and Denali. As Teddy Roosevelt said, and you can look out the window or look up here, <laughs> of the Grand Canyon, leave it as it is. You cannot improve upon it. The ages have only have been at work on it, and man can only mar it. What you can do is to keep it for your children and for all who come after you as the one great sight that every American should see. In many ways, this concept, this value of conservation that is a core American value, um, 
was born in the conservation writings of George Perkins Marsh, the conservation farming of Frederick Billings, and the conservation philanthropy of Lawrence Rockefeller. And that is on display at Marsh Billings Rockefeller National Historic Park, where you will learn that it was their ideas, that it was actually the women that, that implemented and carried it out on the ground. These same values can be found at the, Teddy, at the John Muir National Historic Site or here at Teddy Roosevelt's Elkhorn Ranch, where Roosevelt really imagined a great western landscape that would be preserved and protected and, uh, and flush with big game that he actually loved to hunt. It was the raiding of our cultural heritage and the looting of the Anasazi sites at the turn of the century and the cliff dwellings that galvanized a movement around the value of protecting our antiquities in the establishment of Mesa Verde National Park in 1906. And today, throughout the West, the same core American value can be found in Chaco and Hovenweep and Yucca House and Casa Grande and Montezuma Castle as well, all National Park Service sites. While these sites represent the Native American antiquities, the U.S. has also taken a core value around respect for contemporary Native Americans and are reinterpreting sites where there was war, bloodshed, like here at Little Bighorn, uh, to understand both sides uh, of these battles. Little Bighorn, Big Hole Battlefield, Canyon de Shea, Hubble Trading Post, Devil's Tower, and Nez Perce, all sites that recognize contemporary Native Americans that that still have the opportunity to practice their cultural traditions you know, within these places as well as all national parks for themselves as well as for the education and appreciation of the American people. That's critically, by the way. I think every American wants to wrap themselves in the flag of patriotism, which is obviously a core American value. And where better than the Statue of Liberty or the solitude of Flight 93 National Memorial. And to really embed that in our newest citizens, the National Park Service has been partnering with the Immigration and Naturalization Service, where we use National Park Service sites to swear in new citizens. We've done dozens of these over the last year on the, on the deck of the USS Constitution, on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, even in the deserts of Death Valley. National Park. Where better than a national park to infuse patriotism for our country, for new citizens? You know, our elected and would-be elected officials talk of freedom as a core American value, and of course we have a national park and independence that, that exemplifies freedom. Even where the signing of the Declaration of the Constitution, even after the signing, not everyone was free. It took nearly another hundred years for our enslaved Africans to, to become Americans, to be free and attain citizenship. And this story crisscrosses our national parks from Ford's Theater National Historic Site to Frederick Douglass Home, it's Frederick Douglass Home, to Nicodemus, to Fort Monroe, one of our newest units of the national park system, where really the concept of emancipation, the Emancipation Proclamation found its legal roots and was picked up then by Lincoln uh, and, and applied uh, to slaves during the Civil War. As we look to the election this November, there really could be no greater American value than the right to vote, which came to women only in 1920 and was the result of a long struggle that is told well at Women's Rights National Historic Park. And for African women, at the National Park Service site of Mary McLeod Bethune as well. Now, I lived through the 60s, and uh, there's probably a few other old hippies in the room, but I think most of us would believe that peace is an American value. We believe it so much that we've established some national parks specifically for peace. Waterton Glacier International Peace Park in Shawnee uh, the National Memorial, which is in El Paso, that celebrates the peaceful settlement of our border with Mexico. Or San Juan Island National Historic Park, in which the only fatality in our fight over the border dispute with Canada 
was a pig. <laughs> and of course, newest is to reestablish our relationship with Mexico and a troubled border is happening in a national park, at Big Bend National Park. And this November, we will reopen the peaceful crossing at Boquillas uh, uh, after several years of, of working with Mexico. Ken Burns said that the national parks are the Declaration of Independence applied to the land. Regardless of your ethnicity, your social status, whether you are rich or poor, Americans appreciate the beauty of grand landscapes. And our national parks provide the opportunity for all to experience that beauty as equals. It's pretty hard not to feel a wash of pride in your country when you are in the Grand Canyon or under the giant sequoias of Sequoia National Park. These are our American cathedrals. But even the American values around creativity and the arts can be found in the national parks, from contemporary performances at Wolf Trap National Park for the Performing Arts, or at the Carter Bear Theater of Rock Creek, or the, the dark plays at the creepy Eugene O'Neill National Historic Site, or to the daily performances at New Orleans Jazz or to the sculptures of Augustus St. Gaudens National Historic Park. Uh, the arts are a fire in the national parks. You really don't understand the range of the National Park Service's responsibility until you see a ranger in uniform hitting his jazz licks on the stage in New Orleans. <laughs> Perhaps there are no more classic American values than our pioneering spirit, ready to take on the wilderness, and from that spirit is still alive at Homestead or Lewis and Clark along the trail or at the lonely outpost of Fort Platts at the Lewis and Clark National Historic Park. You know, I could go on and on and on about this. I could rattle these off from all day, comparing, you pick a topic, you pick, a, you pick anything, Justice, Brown versus Board of Education National Historic Park. Our desire to restore Redwood National Park the Everglades that we're working on, or the Alwa Dam removals in Olympic. The right for education for all, Little Rock Central High School. Or our work ethic to stand up in times of crisis, Rosie the Riveter, World War II home from. The 398 units of the National Park System are really a collective expression of who we are as a people. They are an aggregate of what we really value the most about ourselves, and they deliver messages to future generations about these experiences that have made America a symbol for the rest of the world. They really represent the best of the best to learn about American values. And I would suggest there are dozens of, dozens of field guides out there to birds and mushrooms and waterfalls and hot tubs and all kinds of things, many of them in national parks. But there's no field guide to American values. And I would suggest as we think about promoting our national parks into the future, particularly the ones that are lesser known, that I think a field guide would work. You know, a few years ago there was a book that was called Assassination Vacation, uh, which was about going to assassination sites. Well, it's time for the American Values Vacation. So the, in, the 100th anniversary is coming up, and it should be much more than just a celebration. It really calls for an introspection, and it calls for a look into the future. We know the national parks, the big ones in the East, are, are treasured and loved. And the recent polls conducted uh, by the sponsors of this, this group have seen that. There are a lot of things that we do pretty well. Um, but if you look at our founding legislation, our Organic Act, you will see that it, the NPS was established to promote and regulate the use of our national parks. And I'd say for the first hundred years, we've done a pretty good job on the old regulate side of that, and not such a hot job on the promote side. So on the eve of this centennial, it's time we start promoting. So um, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the National Park Foundation and the National Park Service agreed, uh, finally, after a long process, to hire uh, gray advertising. Uh, to lead a promotional marketing campaign for the National Park Service to 2016. Um, we've never really done that. This is the first time. And we have uh, a 
foundation has put up a million dollars uh, to, uh, to begin the process with Ray. The first round being research uh, and then moving into the creative uh, phase. Uh, we expect to Ray to be with us through 2016, actually to 2017. And we are tasking them to make it a big umbrella, a big tent, uh, that all of you, all of our partners can participate actively and benefit from this campaign that is going to be focused on a number of things. One is visitation, absolutely, uh, that we are hoping to promote visitation, particularly to the areas that people perhaps have not visited or are not visiting uh, in any great numbers. We want to promote awareness. There's a large population out there that are, as we would say, unaware non-users about, uh, about our parks. We want to promote advocacy, because we need, we need support. We need constituencies out there that that are active around the concept of these places being preserved as we will not have them into the future if we do not have a strong constituency. We need engagement. That's everything from volunteerism to, uh, to active participation or, you know, actually coming in and contributing in some way. We need philanthropy. Uh, we need individuals that are willing to give of their wealth, of their time, um, to our friends groups, to the foundation. So it's not just targeted uh, to the National Park Service Foundation. And we need people to really care. Uh, and we are we're particularly focused on young people and communities of color that may not be uh, connected now. I'm not sitting there and Joey. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to keep talking while you said bring that back up, okay? Um, we've really not promoted the national parks, as I mentioned, for their broad range of opportunity and experience. Um, so I think the huge opportunity here with Gray, and uh, we actually have a meeting with them on Monday, uh, to, uh, to get them actively engaged with us, to target them, to go out and talk to you. Uh, what we want to do is to create, to task them with creating a set of, of clear messages uh, that can be used um, across the media platforms, all forms, as well as with our own employees. When I say our own employees, I mean all of the concession employees, our friends groups, our advocacy groups, uh, the concessions employees as well. So we're all speaking with a common voice about these places that, uh, and what they mean uh, to the American public as well. You know, um, at a recent, uh, I mentioned the designation of Cesar Chavez uh, a National Monument, and I, I want to tell you a little bit of story about this because I think it, it exemplifies how powerful the National Parks can be. We had been pursuing a designation for Cesar Chavez uh, for about a decade. Uh, we had to build a relationship with the Chavez family. Uh, Cesar died relatively young. Uh, as a, at least uh, in part from his fasting. Uh, but the, the Chavez has actually lived pretty long, so all of his, his peers are still alive. And the concept of bringing the National Park Service into his family, into his, his legacy, was a little bit of a challenge for them to understand why they would do that. And so it took us many, many years to sort of build upon that. And finally, they sort of agreed. And so when we were out there two weeks ago in La Paz for this designation, I, I, uh, I talked to essentially their attorney about this, who was at the key of it. And he said they had had many, many deep discussions about whether or not to let the Park Service in, this federal agency, into their community, into their legacy. And he said there were two factors that made the difference. One was they knew over time they were all going to die out and everybody that had known Cesar would be dead. And so who was going to carry on that legacy? Who was going to carry that story? And they said, well, you know, clearly the Park Service is in this for the long haul. We're the, in the perpetuity business. And so that was, that was number one. But probably more, more powerful was the family went up to Manzanar uh, and visited Manzanar National Historic Site and saw the exhibits that had uh, been done you know, recently by the National Park Service, about the Japanese-American internment story. And they saw how we had 
um, sensitively handled a very, very complex, very difficult, very dark period, both for the people, for the country, and handled the issue of racial discrimination really at an industrial scale that was done to the Japanese Americans. And then we were brave enough, even within that exhibitry, to talk about its contemporary application to times of war when we have unrest in the Middle East and there are similar kinds of things happening in the United States uh, with Muslims. We That convinced them that the National Park Service could handle uh, the story of their father um, and the United Farm Workers movement as well. And you know, and at that moment I really couldn't have been more proud of the National Park Service that we can take on these complex issues and be relevant as well. How are we doing? <laughs> okay, so I want to talk briefly about call to action and then I'm going to kick it open just for a second. The call to action is our game plan between now and 2016. Um, it is an invitation for your participation. It has four broad goals um, to connect people to parks, bring parks to the people, to really strengthen our role in public education, to expand our leadership in conservation and preservation, and to improve our effectiveness as an organization through, through reducing the bureaucracy and being a better partner uh, with all of your organizations as well. I mentioned yesterday when I stood up and talked that there have been lots of plans in the past with lots of grand thoughts, but not much implementation. This is about implementation. This is about what can, we can do, even in a constrained environment like we are working in today. Things like going digital, or doing arts of fire, or doing transportation for kids. We have been using an organization consultant, um, uh, Margaret Wheatley, to, to help us figure out how you, how you transform an agency that has 100 years of history can be incredibly bureaucratic. We are, we are uh, geographically distributed, we're big, we're decentralized. And it, her point really is, is that creativity is already happening. Innovation is already happening in your organization. You just need to focus on it, illuminate it, nurture it, create communities of practice around it, and it will spread. And so that's actually what we are doing. We, by identifying the 39 actions, we're identifying the focus areas of where we want to see innovation and creativity to occur. And then we are trying, Peggy and I and Julia and others are trying to facilitate that and draw together communities of practice both inside and outside of the organization to carry these forward, this innovation. And it will transform. It will achieve the kind of future that I've just articulated in the last panel. Um, a few years ago, an author was given a talk on leadership, and he said that uh, people don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And examples, of course, are Martin Luther King or Apple, for instance. And, you know, there were other computer companies out there besides Apple, but it was the, it was the why, the innovation that came out of that really made Apple succeed beyond others. You know, Martin Luther King, when he stood on the uh, steps of the Lincoln, and gave his I have a dream speech, he didn't give I have a plan speech. <laughs> it's important to have a plan. We have to have a vision. And that vision is that the National Park Service's stewardship and engagement with the American people are around the values that bind us as a nation and serve as a beacon for the rest of the world. And we need every one of you engaged with us uh, to accomplish that between now and 2016 for the next century. Thank you. Yeah, just to, yeah. So if, if Quentin and Terry and uh, will join us up here, but, but uh, let's just open it up. I mean, I, first of all, I just want to tell you that John obviously responded to this idea of grand thoughts because I think this was truly an important statement, John. I think that that's, that's the vision that we can all join shoulder to shoulder with you and every other Park Service employee and be proud of what we can get done together. So, so uh, with that, uh, can we just open it up sure. to... Yeah, Sarah? maybe about 15 minutes and okay. i got to go hold. I'd like to thank you for your efforts in helping to promote the parks. 
Uh, one of the things that I've been saying for a couple of years at these meetings is in our Florida website, uh, the National Park Service Everglades website, you can't figure out where Shark Valley is, you can't figure out what they're to do. And this summer, for the first time, our new biodiesel trams are on the home page. So we appreciate that very much, and that's due to you and passing that down through the ranks that that's happened. Yeah, we really want to use everything we can, and I think social media is probably one of the best avenues. You guys have been talking about it, technology and others, but in talking to Gray, Gray particularly is focused on this capacity for individuals to tell stories and that link others uh, as well uh, to, uh, to how you can have these kinds of experiences and that we create the platform for that to be, uh, to be elevated. All the way back. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, John, thank you for your presentation. And uh, if you pointed to an affirmative work with the same factor, thanks for having me. But I think another element that's critical, uh, which I've seen in my career, is inspirational leadership. And, and uh, I think we would all agree that um, you are the person in the right place at the right time to provide that inspirational leadership. Thanks. So my question is, um, regardless of who wins the election in the next few weeks, what can we do to... What can we do? <laughs> no, uh, what can we do to help encourage the administration to see the value and the opportunity to help promote a successful centennial? And I think through the vision you just displayed, the connection to American values and the role of the Park Service plays. Perhaps help them see the opportunity that is reflected in this vision of the National Parks to encourage them to provide, frankly, a little more leadership than we've seen and encouragement in the current administration and, and hopefully more moving forward regardless of the needs. Yeah, I think the, the most important thing to remember is that uh, is that regardless of who's what happens in November, whether what happens with the Senate or the House or the President, Presidency, 2016 is coming. It's the 100th anniversary of the National Park Service. It is an opportunity for whoever is in leadership roles, in governorships or, or uh, federal positions, uh, to wrap themselves around 2016, you know, like we did in 1976 in the American Bicentennial when I started in the National Park Service, to wrap yourself around these core values and remind people what it means and all of the benefits that come from them, economic benefits, jobs, you know, patriotism, re-engagement, connecting all Americans to these, uh, to health, uh, to education, uh, all of these core things that are challenges for this country. And actually we have a solution. We have something, you know, the jobs that are around our national parks are sustainable. They're not exportable. They are at the local level, they, they help gateway communities. They are often rural. Um, that uh, they, by linking parks up thematically, you can get people to stay longer and go further uh, to these places and create uh, an economy around these, uh, these opportunities. I think that what's fascinating to me, and I've told this story, and I don't care to be flippant, but it is kind of humorous to me, when I go up on the hill and I meet with uh, some of the newest members of Congress who have come in, particularly in the House, uh, and, um, you know, are sort of, uh, you know, taking great sport at, at beating up the federal government, I go up to see them and I, I say, you know, I'm the director of the National Park Service, and they're like, oh, National Park Service. And they, they pull down the shades and they run their staff out of the room, and then they tell me how much they love the National Parks. Um, and, uh, and, and it's like they don't want to admit it. Uh, that, that they're afraid to admit that there might be some aspect of the federal government that's actually a good thing. Uh, because somehow that isn't going to play. But I think what you can do is to help embolden them to be able to willing to step up. And uh, uh, Scott R uh, Ridgell, who is the uh, congressman, he's a Tea Party guy, he's a congressman from Fort Monroe, from the Hampton area. You know, he, he was completely supportive of the establishment of Fort Monroe National Monument. And he said, I get it. He said, I'm not anti-government. I see this as an opportunity for the economy of the, of the Chesapeake Bay, of Hampton, his area. Uh, he's, he got the history. He, he was totally supportive. So I think all of you who have very different voices 
within your constituencies, within your communities, within your governments, within your, your elected officials. You have a different voice than I have. Uh, and use that voice uh, to say this is an opportunity for this country to rally around some things that really bind us, which is this absolutely unique American idea uh, of our national parks. And I think the other thing I want to mention, too, is that in all due respect to my 398 children, uh, uh, it's not all about them. Uh, the National Park Service actually does a lot of other things uh, that are incredibly important to this country as well. The National Register Program, the National Historic Landmarks Program, we have community organizers. Uh, uh, Lee mentioned, uh, can we get the, the health community engaged? I have 50 public health officers in the National Park Service uh, in Bennett, and they've been with me for 90 years. Uh, I have a medical epidemiologists, uh, doctors that work daily with us. And we are totally engaged with the Center for Disease Control. The National Park Service and CDC will be hosting the Healthy Parks, Healthy People International Conference in Florida in 2014. Uh, that we would expect thousands of people to come from around the world to talk about the role public lands and parks play in public health. Um, and I think that's a game changer for us when we begin to market these places the concessioners have incredibly stopped up on, stepped up on this uh, healthy food initiative. I, I've been enjoying the competition between <laughs> Delaware North and GSI and Airmark and Zantera and others who can be healthier uh, with their foods. And, uh, uh, and it's really fun. Uh, and, and Forever is doing a fantastic job here of, of demonstrating that as well. Um, and now we need to promote these places uh, as healthy destinations uh, as well. We talked about that in the, in the new future. Hey, John, this will, be, this will be a good segue to that. So, uh, A, we, we really, uh, speaking on behalf of, of everybody, but also the National Parks Promotion Council, we love the fact that promotion has now boiled itself to the top. We love the partnership, the engagement with the NPF. Uh, we love the fact that some of your team now recognizes that this is a great opportunity, especially in light of the centennial. And uh, we're thrilled about that. We hope it uh, breaks loose the MOU with the NPPC, and we're you know, ready to collaborate and cooperate in any way. And uh, you can watch your video now.